Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shot episode 522. This time with Mr. Paul Morgan Stadler. Now if you don't know that name, it probably means you haven't played Phantasmagoria 2, of which Paul is the star. Now he is a professional actor with a lot of great uh, theater uh, experience as well as uh, all sorts of performances he gives. He reads uh, famous letters. Uh, he does a lot of work in addition to uh, the uh, the gaming stuff, uh, but more recently he's uh, started his own YouTube channel called Conversations with Curtis, uh, where he talks about uh, his experience uh, working on Phantasmagoria 2, but also uh, he's got all sorts of other talents uh, from Sierra on as well to talk about not just uh, Phantasmagoria, but all sorts of other games, adventure games. Uh, he's even got some fun uh, video series with his son. Uh, anyway, it's a really a good YouTube channel, and I, uh, you know, who would want to pass up an opportunity to have my own conversation with Curtis? <laughs> uh, so we got a lot to cover, as you can imagine. So without further ado, here is Mr. Paul Morgan Stetler. Everything's good. It's uh, is it pro it's Professor Barton, I understand. Yes. <laughs> well, I heard you say your dad's a. Uh... English professor too, right? I was going to say, there's a lot uh, we seem to have in common. Uh, you being an English professor, a tenured professor at a uh, at a university. My father did that. I was an English, I got my English degree uh, undergrad. And I was in Minnesota not too long. Actually, just last oh, week, I was in oh, St. Paul. We've got so many things in common. It's weird. Too much, right? Yeah. I was born in Louisiana too. You were born in Louisiana? So I was born in Louisiana, moved to Minnesota. Wow, that's great! Yeah, I was born in New Orleans. My dad got his, uh, my dad got his um, PhD at, at Duquesne University, yeah. uh, and he was born and raised in Pittsburgh, and so he got his undergrad degree in Tulane. So Tulane to Duquesne, and then that brought us out to California. But yeah, I almost went to Tulane. I was going. Oh, to really? Go. Yeah, it was it was a choice between uh, going to law school and Tulane. Or going on to uh, get an English PhD. So obviously I made the latter choice, but <laughs> yeah. did you ever get up to Natchitoches, Louisiana? Or... No, I, I I haven't been back there. You know, I was just a little kid when we left. So I, I I've spent very little time there, even though I'm I'm proud to have been born there, but don't have much of a of a memory of it. Um but yeah, you know, it's funny, I was in St. Paul last week for this. I have this other company called letters allowed it's a performing oh, arts yeah. company that that goes into we, we we take letters from real people throughout history and kind of it's like a little podcast live music and we read them out loud and we have a slideshow and stuff so we've been traveling around the the country the past few years and uh, we were in saint paul just this past saturday and it's funny because we we performed at a theater at saint catherine's university which was right next door to saint joseph's university and you're at saint clouds i mean there's a lot of saint saint something spot. universities in those uh in those that area i could have done this in person oh yeah. i was pretty it was, it was pretty it was a quick turnaround so probably wouldn't have been able to make it happen but i was just thinking you had talked to some of your videos of, of the, or i guess the first conversations with curtis here you talked a little bit about the theater being involved in the theater and the, how warm that community is and all that and you know, I was thinking of the, the same thing, you know, because I was, uh, I tried to, for some reason, I was always friends or knew people that were in the theater program at uh, Northwestern State. And I'm like, yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> the best it, parties, the, the most fun, interesting conversations. I mean, the, the most diverse group of people oh, you're going to oh. find, people who are very, very, you know, all all types, of, all types, which is great. It definitely, I found that theater made me you know it just got me out of my bubble I, I i learned to be more accepting of of different people and the way they were and not only accepting but embracing differences it was just such a really neat uh education for me you know not really realize how interesting other people are until you're <laughs> it's true it's true and then you've been doing this uh so you not only are you a full time professor, but you when you when did you start? Because we both have a channel now, and it's we're we're interconnected. I think the, the what I've realized the difference between us is that we both well we the similarities we both have channels 
about classic video games. The difference is that you know what you're talking about and I don't have a clue. And so that gives us, you know, we're not competing with each other. Maybe. Yeah, I was thinking about how in some ways we're both, you know, you talked about how you were kind of an outsider when you got into games, you know, and you got cast as a role. It wasn't like you're this hardcore Sierra fan or, you know, something like this. And, you know, I sometimes feel like those I'm kind of an outsider in that I, yeah, I played the games, but I haven't made them. I'm not part of the games industry. Right. I always I feel like that kind of gives it, it's kind of an advantage in a way. Well, it's yeah, like, you know, I've, I'm, I'm writing, you know, in the world, you know, luckily for me, I've got other things that I do that also bring me joy. This has come to me very late uh, in the game, but it does make me laugh that I have this one teeny <laughs> little credit from a long time ago that is somehow giving me credibility that I don't think I really deserve, but, but I'll take it. Well, you know, I, I think it's deserved. I mean, this is, a, you know, you, you even said that you get, you get all these uh, reactions from people that are like, this game changed their lives, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's a big deal. You know, I guess we could just jump into the. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Yeah. We can dive into anything. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this game, I, I think it's a, you know, somebody who writes a lot about games and thinks about these big shifts in the gaming industry, it comes up all the time, right? Because it's kind of like the pinnacle of the full motion video in this whole genre that people thought. I mean, I got so many, you know, full motion video games sitting here. It was like Malcolm McDowell and Tim oh, Curry yeah. and, and then some of these. And of course, uh, Mark Hamill and the Wing Commander. I mean, yeah. it goes on and on. But yeah, it seemed like there was a point, you know, the mist, some of those mist games have a lot of full motion video. But it really seemed like there for a while that this was going to be the future, right? We we're going to have real actors. And like I was, I was it's kind of fun that you're the first uh, guest I've had on the show that I could say is the star. <laughs> you, know, you starred in this game. You know, that's yeah. not a credit you, you know, would normally think about. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, what? You know, I don't, I mean, you probably talked about this in some of your programs, but. You know, what What do you think happened? Why didn't this just launch? I mean, I still don't quite understand what, why that. You know, like I think, I think if it had launched, you know, today, it would be, and it's all, you know, and there's a new, there's, there's clearly a resurgence, especially in the UK. Um, there's a, there's some really cool FMV, I guess, you know, that's, doesn't, I guess full motion video is is kind of an archaic term at this point, but but there are a lot more games being produced right now because it's so much easier to do and it's so much cheaper to do. I think back in the day, um, you know, they were just trying to figure it all out, and and you know, we're, I'm starting to play more FMV games myself. You know, everything I play right now is for the first time, so I've I've come to playing games. <clears throat> very late uh in the game um but like right now we just started playing that one of the tex murphy games under a killing moon and so that, that was made in 94 and even before the first phantasmagoria and you just see all the kernels of how games were going to advance you know you saw some there was some i can i'm trying to look at it th with fresh eyes of like what this must have felt like when it first came out. Like you watch it now, it's a little cheesy, it's clunky, it's hard to move around. But but at the time, they were doing remarkable things. But I just don't think they that that the um they were able to I think that their ideas were bigger than the um the technology that was there at the time. And so as a result, it was super expensive. And I think that games like phantasmagoria 2 kind of broke the budgets a little bit and i think it just was too much work and too much money and not enough big bang for their buck because also shooter games were coming around really strong at that time and you're just not going to compete with that you know and so i think i think it just came along a little too soon and and uh just had a short little burst and then it went away well, maybe you could have a hand in bringing it back because, you know, some of these games like yours become a cult classic. And, yeah, I think people just, uh, I always felt like they just gave up on this too quick. <laughs> There's so much more potential there that's, that's yet to be tapped. You know, I had a, it was kind of serendipity. I had uh, Roberta and Ken Williams on 
<laughs> my show not too long ago. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, that's it's, 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 uh, she was really animated about about this topic. It's a lot of uh, a lot of fun. But you know, if you look at the era, you know, and if we had a your game up there, and then we looked at some of the uh, 3D games that were contemporary by that time. You'd say, wow, the full motion video games look so much better. <laughs> well, some of them did. They were getting better. I mean, I, I'll say that I feel like the early 3D stuff was yeah, yeah. Cartoony at best. Right. And so is yeah, so is some of those early FMV games. I think the thing about our uh, whatever you feel about Puzzle of Flesh, the thing that I think you can't dispute is that because we weren't filming on green screen because we had sets and we were filming on locations <clears throat> lighting and and the cinematography is pretty pretty superior to just about anything else out there it really felt like movie quality that they were doing this is this is a screen capture from one of the sets it's the, the this is the th uh psychologist set and this was all art directed this is not a picture these were that was an actual chair and an actual desk and props and all that stuff was in that split space and so it really had a look to it that and that's why i agree with you it would have been fun to see if it had continued how much more cinematic could it have been you know because they were really trying some new stuff with us yeah i remember talking to them mm -hmm. ken's got a book where he talks a little bit about the first phantasmagoria and just the, the money that was involved and of course they were having all these financial troubles that had nothing to do with you know the games they uh, that they were working on at the time but you know yeah there's so many mistakes that they made i won't get too far into that but you know i just felt like that it just was a lot of bad luck i think you know maybe that played something um i don't know maybe but you know they were i'm just a my, it blows my mind that that company may not only in, in like with less in less than a year, they put out Phantasmagoria one, Phantasmagoria two, Gabriel Knight, uh, Sins, at Sins of the Fathers. That's another FMV, three huge FMV games within a, you know, less than a 24 month you know, it, within less than two years, it's just stunning that they were able to get all that done. So I don't know. Yeah, it would be great if it came back in some way or another. I, I don't know. Uh, again, I do think some people would say that it is back and and that people are doing, you know, there's some pretty cool stuff out there right now. You know. Yeah, I was watching Netflix and I think Amazon Prime. It seemed like all the streaming services are kind of dipping their toes in the water. Of uh, yeah, there's one with Bear Grylls I watched. Right. Yeah. And, and Mark. Wasn't but these and they're more like choose your own like they're not quite the fmv it's more like you know you get to a certain dead end and then we get to choose which way to go it's like that which i think is great uh, but that's only one small part of of what you know a good fmv would be you know they could push that to the level of you know an inter, you know full interactive game yeah might be on to something because you know i think there's a lot of people they they watch their favorite characters their favorite actors and it wouldn't it be cool to see this character in a game and it's yeah. them? <laughs> now we've thought about that. You know, I, we just don't have enough. You know, this is a my my channel conversation with Curtis is is a. Let's take a look it, at the channel here. It's a small, you know, it's a small YouTube channel that that has found some a little bit of uh, a little bit of love out there, and um, you know we. A little bit of love. This thing needs to get a lot of love. I mean, <laughs> God, the work you're doing. Well, we we you mostly just you know, we stream games. And my partner has been a Daniel is just a, a he's been great at keeping things going when I'm I'm traveling. But yeah, we we mostly are playing games. Daniel has his own channel now where he's doing a lot of tech talks with uh, the, the creators of much of these games, and um, I still do interviews when I can, um, but. You know, so we're throwing a lot of content out there, but it really is just able to sit at our computers during a, a break from our regular day and do it. But the idea of like putting together a Phantasmagoria 3 is would be an undertaking that I think is more than my my current life would allow. Because, I, you know, I think we have things in place. You know, we have Victoria 
uh, Marcel, who uh, uh, is on our channel a lot, and she was the star of the first game. And both her character and my character lived at the end of our games and never met each other. So it would be really fun to come up with a storyline where this is fate. <laughs> it could be, you know, it could be, but somebody with more connections and money and effort and time than I have uh, would be the one that would have to put it together. I'd be more than happy to help, but don't have the ability to spearhead it, you know? I oh, see so you got one with David Lee home. Well, yeah. I this to uh, Roberta Williams and it's like, well, what about future plans? Cause you know, they did that colossal cave. Uh, did you see their colossal cave 3d? Yeah. We, we played a little bit of it on one of our streams and it was before they did their, you know, they, they released it and then saw a lot of things that they hadn't, that they could re improve on. And then I think that they did those improvements. I haven't had a chance to, to play it since they, since they re rehashed it out. But I did mention to her, you know, because they were, we were talking a little bit about future projects and I'm like, how about Phantasmagoria? You know, <laughs> how about a third game? And she didn't say no, you know, she seemed like she was kind of interested in that. So, well, yeah. they don't even have the rights anymore. That's the hard part. They'd have to wrangle it back from now, it would be Microsoft, which the word, the word on the street is they'll be more forgiving and more generous about bringing this stuff back. But uh, but yeah, there's not a huge demand at this point. I do think that again, I think if someone, if someone with, I have no doubt that if a, you know, if, if a fundraiser went up, if we're saying we had the idea for a game and we want to make however many much money to get going on, I think that there would be a lot of people who'd want to see that, but it's a Herculean effort, and I'm not sure who that person is that would be the one to make it happen, you know? I guess it, you think it surely it would be cheaper to make something like this now. I think so, yeah. Oh, I think so. By all means, yeah. Uh, I want to say Anyway, what, what else? I mean, otherwise, we just feel bad that it's not... It's okay. We had a good time. I mean, it, there was a great period where this stuff happened, and... and uh, but you want to reprise the roles. I mean, you're not saying you wouldn't. Oh, I'd sure I'd do it. It'd be fun. Yeah. I mean, if, if it was the right, if the right thing came along and worked well. Yeah. Excellent. You said to find Blob. I think Blob's. Yeah. Right. <laughs> My favorite part. When of the did movie. you first, uh, when did you first encounter that game? Uh, I was trying to, I should have written down the year. It definitely wasn't when it came out because I hadn't, I was like you. There's no way I could afford, if I have afforded the PC. So this came out in 96. Probably uh, early 2000s, I'm guessing. Yeah. Was it due to uh, someone sh sharing it with you, a YouTube thing? Or what was it that, what do you remember about why playing it at that point in your, in your gaming uh, life? Yeah, you know, my assistant producer, we, we go way back. You know, we were going to write a book on adventure games. And so I thought, well, I should play as many as I, as I could. So then I got on this uh, full motion video <laughs> kick and did all the gabriel knights and everything but you know the one that uh, i think matt's favorite was the phantasmagoria series so we we're always talking about it you know? okay cool what was the game that that i'm sorry i'm gonna i'm gonna turn the tables on you for that but what was the what was the, FM, what was the fmv game for you that was like the first one where well what's the fmv game that just sticks out to you as sort of the the highlight of your of your game plan such a tough question. I really like some people don't like the mist uh, games as much as I do, but I really like the. Or, do we count those as full motion videos? I don't know. I've never played them, so I, I, I've heard that. I've heard that game, and it's on our list. And and one of these days, I'll take a look. But the third uh, I don't game know. I really enjoyed, and really the fourth one too. I just thought they were just fantastic. Uh, but Gabriel Knight, probably Gabriel Knight Two, is one that people love that game. That that seems to be a lot of people's very all time favorite. Yeah. Yeah, what what else? I even like the there's even the cheesy ones like the uh, what is it? I got a couple copies. Yeah, Mummy, Tomb of the Pharaoh. As <laughs> a Frank, I think a, one of these. Tim Curry's in one of these. Yeah, yeah. That's just a blast. It, it's I've... just much fun uh, watching those. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of some other. There's probably so many. You know, it's I think sure. there's a four one uh, too that's got full motion video. Is that the, either the second or third one of those? Uh, but I was, you know, I was going to say, even the, yeah, there's kind of cheesy, you know, and you kind of laugh, but there's just something enduring about them. 
Yeah. <laughs> Something charming yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, you've got that uh you got the the poster behind you of our, of the game. And I, I I'll say that I've I've I'm Same. proud to have been I think it's one of the coolest sort of image posters. And usually I'm not a big fan of an image or a picture of the actual person. I, I usually like art, you know, art design, but I think they did a great job with this. And, and uh, it's kind of cool to be associated with a, with an image like that, that is so striking, you know? Yeah. It's part of the classic appeal of the game. You know, that yeah. <laughs> all the sort of controversy at the time. I mean, it's, Oh, for sure. Funny to think how big a deal was made about that. Like it wasn't. I think you had said it really wouldn't even be NC seventeen. I don't know if you said that in one of the other videos, commentators. But uh, yeah, they oh, made they it. Were, they were definitely trying to push. It wasn't like an extra uh, a little bit of TNA, I suppose. Yeah, it was that whole thing with the the swing? I guess. And, <laughs> it's no worse than what you'd see on Cinemax late at night. <laughs> no, no, it's pretty tame when it comes to that. But I think for a video game, oh, uh, yeah. having nudity, having sex, having the violence, having sort of be, you know, progressive, progressive, you know, BDSM, things like that. That was just, they, they were pushing the envelope. I think that was a time when they realized, oh, there's a market here for a more mature, well, mature might be right, the right word, but a more, uh, you know, more adult kind of uh, game out there. So They're kind of elevating the media <laughs> away from like kids. Yeah, stuff more. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Was that more, was that more Lorelai or Roberta? I mean, who was kind of pushing it in that direction? I, I get the feeling it was, it was Roberta. Uh, and then when, because I think with Roberta and the first one, they certainly had, you know, they had a, a rape scene in that. They had some pretty intense moments in that. Really much more gory blood in that particular. There's one couple scenes in our game that are pretty gory, but um, but yeah, I think when that door was opened, Lorelai was happy to jump through it and 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 take it to another level, which I which I thought, you know, I admired from I admired her uh I, I admired the things that she decided to to tackle in that game, you know, in terms of the themes and such outside of the, you know, the general horror, horror show. Yeah. Serious, serious writers. They had so much to, you know, yeah. I saw that somebody was saying, where did I come across this? But maybe just, uh, they wanted to see a remake of the ending. Uh, Cause my understanding is things got really rushed at the, the end of the game. Wasn't what it was supposed to be. Some, was it possible? Would it be possible somehow to like redo that portion? <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. I mean, we've talked about that. Yeah. So what happened was the the game. Anybody who's played it will probably once Curtis, you know, gets past the uh, down in the sort of the bowels of of WinTech. There's you realize there's this whole underworld, the threshold. And once he's able to go into the threshold and confront him, you know, a version of himself um, in the script and in the original budget, you know, we were going to build like everything else, there was going to be a lot of, a lot more green screen in that, but we were still going to have more uh, set design and, and it was going to be, there's going to be a lot of adventures and a lot of puzzles in that world for Curtis to have to, to get to the end but yeah we we ran out of money and and uh we were way over budget and and we were a three-month shoot was closer to six months after all is said and done and i just remember them coming in and the crew almost got completely stripped down to just the you know the cinematographer the director a couple lighting people and so all of a sudden we're just filming on a much more shoestring, just trying to get through it and ripping pages that didn't get in. And so the ending just feels, if it feels rushed, it's because it was. And so we did track down a copy of the original script and were able to identify a lot of what that, that ending could have been. I don't know if we could ever film it, but it might be fun someday to like do a, we could do like a live reading of it or something like that. And, and just at least take the script out and read it out loud and make that available for people to hear or something. That could be fun. That, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. And yeah, definitely do that. 
Yeah, the weird sure. thing about those scripts though is that the scripts aren't just like a screenplay where it's it's the story, but there's all the game uh elements too, and there's just a lot of technical jargon that does yeah, I, I we'd have to sort of pour through all that and figure out the best way to to make it work. But yeah, I think that's something we should we should put on our our to do list. Yeah, you could totally do that. Yeah. <laughs> I just thinking though, that must have been so painful just going through that and being so close and knowing you had such a great thing and oh plus i mean all the i mean you were just busting your butt to make this game i mean some of the <laughs> i don't and just playing it you don't even think oh yeah every one of the fidgets you know that had to be filmed and i mean oh my god it must have taken forever yeah there's a lot there was a lot of interesting things to it that's for sure um yeah, and you know, I've mentioned this before, and if for for your fans who may not have uh, heard this, but you know, when you do play the game, you'll notice that. Well, and I'm not sure if because we shot out a sequence, it doesn't always, it's not always just at the beginning, but you'll notice that some of the camera angles and the camera movement and the lighting and the cinematography is just some fantastic work by these they were very young right out of film school usc film school at the time they've gone on most of these guys have gone on to huge careers um but they were hungry and they were talented and they were really creating something amazing but they were also like kids in a candy store they just kept they just kept playing and having fun and as a result more and more time was going by so then you start to see different shots in the game where the camera's just simply in one place and then there's two people talking and there's no you know there's nothing cinematic it's just because it basically what was happening was as the shoot was going on we just couldn't be as creative as we were so you'll see varying degrees of uh of of cinematography yeah i guess none of those folks do they ever call you back and like hey i remember you we worked on that that game together you want to be in my new movie <laughs> yeah no no but the one guy I would really want to talk to is Matt Jensen, who was the cinematographer. I, I reached out to him and he was, it was right during the pandemic. And he, he, he just finished wrapping like Wonder Woman 19, you know, one of the, one of the big movies. So he wasn't available, but yeah, I'd like to get him someday and chat with him about it. I'm sure it'd be fun to reconnect. Well, one thing I talked about a little bit with uh, Roberta, it really stood out to me. She's really adamant on this point that you need live actors in a video game if you're going to do justice to horror or to romance in the, the cgi in her opinion just no no matter how good the cgi is it's just it can't compare to that actor because the live actor is bringing so much you know even like eye movements and stuff that's probably not even conscious <laughs> you know to the part i was just wondering what you're in what, what do you think about that well, you know, I'm I'm biased as an actor and as someone who uh, you know, has spent a lot of time creating work either for the stage or for you know, the, the game or film or TV. Um and when I watch more modern games that have really really good uh uh animation or whatever you want to call it that makes people look real you're right i think i completely agree with, with roberta when it comes to genuine true emotion or chemistry between people whether it's a love scene or a you know people going at each other with with, with high emotion you just you can't you can emulate it and it might serve enough of the game so that you can get involved in the story and want to keep going, but it's not going to, it's not going to give you chills. You know, it's not going to, it's not going to affect you in a way that's, you know, only, I don't think, I don't, I guess I'm, I don't know if CGI or AI can induce the kind of human emotions that human interaction can, uh, I don't think you can ever quite get there. You know, we just watched, uh, my wife and I, some, something popped up on a, uh, some 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 station or some uh, social media and it's it's a woman in a recording studio and she's singing a pop song that we all know and it's somebody recorded her with the headphones on 
and we don't hear the music. We only hear her vocals of that song. So it's a song that you recognize, but you've never heard it just with her vocals before. And it's just a picture of the video of her in the recording studio singing this song. And it gives you chills. It just gives you chills, taking everything away from that song except for her voice and seeing her create it for the first time in the moment. It, there's nothing better than that kind of stuff. And you can't recreate that in, in the, you know, in the world that just that human connection yeah yeah i remember talking a little bit about this similar territory with dominic armado I hey know. i talked to dominic he's a really nice guy yeah we were talking about of course he's a voice actor but we were talking about sort of this uh, idea of in his context he was kind of def <laughs> want to make the case for uh, voice actors in games there's there's a whole profession you know these are highly trained they're very super talented people uh, so why I got uh, why did this, it seems like there's this tendency to try to grab a, a screen actor, you know, even though they're not going to actually be in the game. But but anyway, that's uh, <laughs> putting that aside. <laughs> uh, I was uh, struck by even the power of just a voice. You know, I was playing uh, uh, some of the World of Warcraft, some of the latest uh, patches for that, and there's a uh, we're running around in the in the world, and this this voice actor comes on, and it's like this monster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was struck by the, all the comments suddenly were like, oh, my God, this this guy's got the best, you know, this is the best uh, voice actor. It's, it's just amazing, you know. That's great. <laughs> like, yeah. well, why don't we, you know, how much better would it be, you know, if you had the uh, the video, too? <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. you know, why stop there with just the, you know. But anyway, I, I uh... yeah, this guy, I was thinking, too, with this. Um, I don't know if this is still a thing, if people still talk about this. But I remember when we were looking at some of the final, like the Final Fantasy movies that have come out, at least some of the early ones, uh, they talked about how when something, uh, when CGI gets too realistic, instead of, uh, you know, people liking it, it just makes, kind of creeps you out. And I think they call it something like Uncanny Valley, uh, the uncanny, uncanny Valley effect when it still looks, somebody looks really human, but, you know, there's this, all the subtle things that aren't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of like ai and ai art you know <laughs> so there's something about it that's unsettling you know i don't i'm kind of curious what you think if uh, i don't know if you've really looked into all this ai business that everybody seems to be talking about not really i mean i know it's there and i've had i've seen some of the the, the examples that have been thrown out there and and uh the moment i'm just choosing to <laughs> ignore it i just don't it's not there's too many other things to be worried about at the moment i i, I think I'm, I'm at my fill for what i'm i'm of, of how <laughs> things are going down these days yeah I, I tend to agree i don't really see it as much of a of a threat to at least uh, to stuff i like to watch and play yeah. okay well you know i i that's what i love about theater too and and uh having just gone and done a live show in front of a full house of four or 500 people. There's just nothing better than the back and forth between whoever's creating the art and the audience. And, and, uh, and the thing about theater is that you can do it anywhere at any time. You know, the, the, the whole world could go, uh, you know, the plug could be pulled and there's no more electronics and it'll all go away. But what will always remain are people being able to perform for other people live. All you need is a is a place to do it and for people to be there. So there's something so so basic uh, about about theater and about human connection, telling stories in a unique, intimate way uh, that you just you can't you can't steal that from people. That will always be there. Yeah, I was thinking. I went with some friends recently. We went to a little dinner theater show. And it was, you know, my friends were like, this is, I can't believe how much they were able to accomplish here with just such limited sets. And it was just one little area where they were kind of basic sets and stuff. <laughs> and I was like, look, I've been to theater shows where there's no props, nothing but the actors on stage. And I mean, you were mesmerized the entire time. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing stuff. Uh, all right. So you've done all these videos. I mean, you've played games with, famous people <laughs> it's so trippy watching you play yourself that was 
one for the ages there. <laughs> oh, so I think what you're referring to is your, your uh, face around and stuff. But, uh, well, so are you talking about when I first played Phantasmagoria 2? Well, I'm just working up to a general question here about, okay. you know, you, you really seem to enjoy, you know, your YouTube channel and, you know, working with a, interacting with fans and you know, some great conversations. I'm just wondering, you know, how similar this work is that you're doing with this. Is is it totally different from your other projects or is there some commonalities with theater? It's, you know, there's a lot of commonalities. And I think that part of it is, is being able to, again, it's just, it's all, to me, it's all about what I love and what I've pretty much dedicated my life to is telling stories and, and telling stories and connecting and sharing those stories with people in real time. And, uh, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> um, and now that, you know, and our, our channel is 90 something percent. We do a live stream awesome. on a Monday or a Wednesday, or maybe a Friday if we have, we can do three. And then we just record the live stream and then people can watch it later, but it's live and we have people that join us and we have a conversation with the chat. If things go wrong, they go wrong in real time and we got to deal with it. And uh, if I get stuck in a game or if I get frustrated with a game or if I'm not good at a game, I, you know, that's all happening in real time. And that's to me very much in keeping with what I love to do, which is live performance and being able to tell stories. And so this station or this channel came out of, it was a, you know, it was a uh, COVID related, had some extra time on my hands, realized that, you know, Fantas 2 was about to have its 25th anniversary. Many people over the years had reached out to me and I never really responded because I, I that was the other thing, uh, Matt, is I just didn't know what the, I didn't know if people were just, you know, there was a, there was a great uh, parody uh, play of this game that Noah Antweiler did back in 2008, uh, the Spoonie one. And it was a Mystery Science Theater 3000 and he just nailed it. He had so much fun making fun of the game. It was, and it's absolutely hilarious. And hundreds of thousands of people watched that thing, right? So I loved it. But at the same time, I'm not, I, I wasn't sure where everybody was coming at. I'm all for people having fun and making fun. I just didn't know if I wanted to go on and have people make fun of me. So I kind of stayed in, in the back. But what I've learned, is just what a what a great community this is and how much people truly value this game and games like it and the and the adventure game genre and so when i came out of you know covid i i just thought well i'll just do a I'll come out and say hi and say i haven't done this and answer some questions and then i thought well i'll i'll reach out to the people who made it the artists and the designers and so i started just doing these interviews which i think I could be wrong, but I feel like we've, I've inadvertently created one of the best oral history projects of any video game out there. Cause I talked to the writer and the director and the, you know, the, the grips and the other actors and the, you know, uh, editor and the musician and all that stuff. And so it was really fun to just talk to these people and we could all reminisce and share stories. And then that led to a Patreon and people following and, and we started having a lot of fun. And then I played the game for the very first time, which that was, that was the, I thought that's what you were referring to earlier is that that was very surreal being a head in the bottom of a thing, playing a game where I'm watching me. That was very, very strange. But uh, what was that like? Oh, it was so weird. It's so weird. I, I don't recommend it at all, <laughs> but uh <laughs> but it was great. And then I met Tori, who did the first game. So the, all these little doors started opening up, and we just found ourselves having so much fun. And met this, who's my partner now, Daniel Albu, and he's a game developer out of Israel, and he's a huge fan of these games and just a, a monster of knowledge. And so he's been very good at sharing games with me. And so it's just organically turned into this cool little, you know, channel, and I love it. I, I never would have expected it to happen. And and the people that 
join us are fun and uh, just, it's a really good group. So I, I've really been, it's such a pleasant surprise that this thing has come around and, you know, we just got to our 10,000th subscriber, which is really, by the way, I saw you have 20 something. That's pretty awesome. That's a lot of coming up on like 20 years of this, I think. And let's take, thank you though. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. That's really super fun. Well, I think you kind of nailed something that's always bedeviled me. You know, I get a lot of requests. Why don't you do more adventure games on your channel? You know, they're, they're asking me to do this, but my problem is I don't know how to do it. Cause you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to make fun of something. That's not really my shtick. <laughs> but if I play adventure games straight, then I'm like spoiling everything. Yeah. And half the fun is uh, figuring stuff out for yourself. Having so a good time. Yeah. Really challenge. Like, how do I do this? But uh, your approach is is perfect. I mean, because now uh, you're, you're, it's almost like a director's commentary and there's this whole meta level of <laughs> enjoyment going on. So you're not just watching just somebody play it you know you're, you're getting all this uh i don't even know how to describe uh, <laughs> it's like multiple sensations i guess <laughs> yeah it's been it's really fun um and also i think the the joy my fans get out of it is that i'm playing these games as a you know i'm uh, i'm no spring chicken i've been you know uh, so i'm playing these games for the very first time and I'm playing games that most of our fans played when they were, you know, when they were teenagers and that they're, they're the games that just burned something into their brain. It's like the, it's the nostalgia for them that they love these classic games. And so they love watching me stumble my way through the, you know, the moon logic of all these games. And, and, uh, and so it's a neat, it, it's, it's a unique in that way where, uh, I'm not the expert. I'm any. I'm nowhere near the expert. I'm. I'm the. I'm coming at it from like a like a little kid, just trying to figure out. Hey, I, I. I'm just starting to figure out game logic in general. I, and and now you know, I'm going. Oh, okay. I need to, you know, I need to pick everything up and put it in my inventory, and I need to look around and you know and and you know it's it's super fun. Uh, frustrating, admit, <laughs> oftentimes. <laughs> I mean, in your defense, these games are a lot of these <laughs> kind of notorious for these puzzles that like, how in the world would you know to do that? Oh, totally. Yeah. We were just uh, playing Tex Murphy today and there's like a, a shard of glass behind a dumpster that is nowhere in sight, but you need that shard of glass to get, you know, for the, the game to open up a different, you know, conversation with somebody. But the only way we found it was there's like a little hint button said, find the shard of glass, or maybe someone in the chat said it. But then we stopped and thought, well, how could, why would anybody <laughs> without, without being told or given a hint, why would anybody, first of all, it's not easily, it's actually behind something. It doesn't really look like a shard of glass. It just, you know, so some of those, those things are just so obscure and obtuse. It's uh, incredibly frustrating. And I don't know how you guys did it back in the day when you didn't have the hint books and the, you know, the walkthroughs and the, you'd probably have to call the tech yeah, you people. You had to call and, that zero hotline. Yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> I, somebody told me, I, I forget what this was, uh, but I, I heard that some of the, I don't know if it was Infocom or Sierra or maybe all of them, uh, but there was points where they were making more money selling their hint books and clue books and things like that than they were from the game. That's and my I, understanding too, I don't yeah. Know if that's true or not, but it ought to be true. Yeah, my understanding is that was yeah that was a pretty good cash cow for them. I don't. Know, I think it's is it Gabriel. Have you done a Gabriel Knight three? I think was the. No, we. I've gotten. I didn't get all the way through Gabriel Knight one. I've got some. Uh, there's, I've been, a, there's a puzzle in it, there with a mustache and a cat, and I just <laughs> to me that's just like the classic. And like what the? That's funny. Yeah. So maybe, maybe that was the maybe the problem wasn't so much the full motion video part. It's just. Yeah, that's not much fun to get stuck on a puzzle. And, you know, you. I did have a question about that, actually, about you when you get stuck on a puzzle and you're doing one of these live streams. I mean, do you, yeah, yeah. how does that, do you get self-conscious, you know, with that? Do you feel bad or is it fun? Yeah, there are times, there are times. And I think part of it is, okay. is, um, yeah, it's, it depends, I guess it's partly dependent on the game and, 
also maybe my frame of mind that particular day or or what have you um but there have been times that i've gotten really grumpy you know and really frustrated that i haven't that i'm just not getting it or i'm super frustrated at how obscure the the thing is and uh like the game that that you know i hope don't, don't want to say anything bad about any games but but the the game that i found to be supremely frustrating and as much as i loved the voiceover work and i love the animation there's so much i loved about it but grim fandango just about killed me and and how impossible it was for me to find whatever i was supposed to find at any given point during that game and i just after enough of that over and over and over again not having success it starts to get a little uh it starts to grate on you a little bit so i found myself getting grumpy at times but uh but for the most part i think i've got pretty good humor about it all you know that's such a great game though with it. i mean what a unique look and the, the art direction on that and the, i like that uh, kind oh. of uh, like vibe to it oh totally so much so. to the point that i was just super excited to play it because i love the voice i love the story i love the detective genre and all that but man oh man i just could not get through it no, i'm with you i don't think i there's very few of those games that even the ones that are supposedly easy <laughs> that i've been able to get through without occasionally getting stuck and then yeah yeah you hate i don't know if it's still around there was a site called uhs i remember using that quite a bit and what i liked about it was it would just give you like you would know where it, they knew where the spots were where you might get stuck. Uh, so you could That's what through. I'm finding with the Tex Murphy game, the Under a Killing Moon. It's really, really good. At there's there's a hint book, yeah. and in the first parts of the hints is just kind of telling you what you've already seen. So that's I, not a hint. It's but point. if you're but then you get like a little question mark, and it's up to you if you need to, to click on that. But it's really good about knowing what where you're going to get stuck and it gives you the option to just look at what you've done and decide to keep going from there. Or if you want to get that extra hint, I, I was very impressed with their, the way that they kind of put that all together. Well, now I'm wondering if, if this experience is kind of making you want to design. A... <laughs> no, 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 thank you. I, I would love to. I could have done that much better. <laughs> no, no. I much happier in my, in my little, I love it's but so much better to judge other people than to create something yourself to be judged. Uh, and it's easier to be a critic, I guess. A lot easier, yeah. Well, what's the biggest thing you've learned after doing so many episodes, conversations with Curtis? What do you wish you would have known when you were starting out? You just kind of jumped into this, right? Yeah, it was a big learning curve. I, I I don't look at any of the videos we do. So we've got a lot of content on there, but I, I, I've never gone back. I would say that I feel bad for anybody who watches, uh, especially that first year when I took over, you know, the very first, the very first episodes, I, I utilized this arts uh, program here in Seattle where they were they had technicians kind of connect with artists so that they could stream because none of us knew how to stream other than go on zoom. But, um, so I hired somebody to run the OBS for me, but I couldn't afford that. So finally I, I cracked open OBS and, you know, had to learn everything from scratch. And so as a result, a lot of my early streams, there were just all kinds of technical problems because I was just in over my head and, and whatever I learned, I found that there would be something right above that that I didn't learn that kept me from you know doing it smoothly. So there's a lot of sound issues and all that stuff. So I, I wish I had had more knowledge earlier on and there weren't so many videos out there with really good interviews and really fun streams that have, you know, not the kind of mistakes that are fun to watch, but it got, got kind of old. So, so over the years, I've gotten better. Daniel does a lot of, he does a lot of the OBS from his computer now. So I can kind of just be the person to watch it and, and comment about it. But, uh, but I guess the other thing is what I've had to learn. What's been very interesting for me. I spent 24, 25 years as a professional actor and as a, 
as a result, my job was to be other people. My job was to take on personas and become somebody else. So I really could hide behind that mask of whatever character I was playing. So I've never really had to be myself in front of people. Occasionally I would give a you know, toast at a wedding or something. But being myself in front of an audience, that is terrifying. And so when my other company, Letters Aloud, when I when I created that back in 2014, I hire actors to read these letters and I act as the host. So I will tell the audience what give them some context of what they're about to hear. So that was the first time I had to like be myself on stage. And same thing with these these streams. I've just got to be myself. And it's hard because you're you 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 want to be natural, but it's hard to be natural when you look at the screen and there's 65, 75 people watching live at the same time. You know, there's a there's a part of you that gets a little nervous, you know. Um, so that's it. I think that's the thing. I'm I'm still learning how to relax into being myself in the moment. And and uh it was harder than I thought. <laughs> that's really interesting to to hear that. You know, I think it, it sort of makes sense though, because I I've been struck sometimes I'll watch uh Club Random, I think. Have you ever watched that with <laughs> Bill Maher or, or some of the older stuff like the, the Carson show, Johnny Carson. Yeah. 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 You know, and every now and then you hear an actor talk about how nervous they were and you know to be on that show. <laughs> I was like, oh, why would you be nervous? You're like this star, you know, big star. Yeah. Well, you're the star because you get to yeah. say all these lines that someone else wrote and yeah. hide behind it all. Yeah. That may, totally makes sense. Uh, so let's see. What else do we have here? I think we kind of talked already about the upscaling and those VHS cassettes and the rights. No, well, I will say that. Uh, so, for, for again, I'm not sure how how savvy your 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 fans are on this, but but and stop me if you've already shared this with them. But <clears throat> during this whole process, uh, I got uh, a guy in uh, Paris. I think it was in Paris, some somewhere in France, uh, reached out to me and um uh, said hey i've got these five well first of all when i reached out to wes plate who was the uh editor on uh fantastic two to interview him and to talk to him he shared with me about 25 minutes of uncropped um footage that you know that he used for his reel so he had grabbed some stuff that he edited maybe nine, 10 scenes from the movie. I always call it a movie instead of a game um, from the game. And he used it for his real. So he had that. So he shared that with us. And so we got to see this really pristine, clear images, not images, but full scenes of some of the, some of the game. And so we were able to share some of that. And then, and that's on our site if people want to watch it. Um, but then years, a couple of years ago, we got reached, somebody reached out to us saying, Hey, I, we used to work at the company that did the uh, the language translation. So they would, you know, in France, they had actors come in and uh, and do a French dub uh, of the characters. And so he found five VHS tapes of all of the movie scenes, none of the transitional scenes, but just the actual scenes with with dialogue. <clears throat> Excuse me, and. Uh, he goes, I, I don't have a VHS player, but I, I, I've realized that these tapes were going to get thrown away. So I grabbed them and I've been holding on to them for the last 20 something years. So we did a little fundraiser and we we had those tapes uh, uh, digitized. We didn't know if they were going to, what the, what quality it was going to be in, but it's pretty good. And and there's some really cool. Uh, uh, the, the, <clears throat> yeah, it's, you, yeah, it's worth watching some of this. Yeah, you can see the. Uh, uh, Daniel put together a great little uh, side by side comparison. There we go. So that, that's the intro. This yeah. is what you see in the game, which is pretty, you know, condensed, and there's not a lot of uh, clarity. And if there's some of it about that is really kind of great because it gives it a real moody feel. I'm not sure how long he does this before he goes to the next one. <laughs> there we um, go. But then is it you can skip ahead a little bit. So and that's the in-game video. 
So you can go all the way through that. Then this is the original. Oh, oh now he's going to now he shows the end game versus the original. There you go. Um, oh yeah, that's way sharper. Yeah, you can just see the difference there. Oh wow, you really see it there. Yeah, look at them on the right compared to them on the left. You can just yeah. so we've got all kinds of footage. It's not the full game, but it is all of the uh it is all of the uh dialogue scenes. So again, this is incredible. If someone had the rights and if someone had the time and the know-how we could we could feasibly put together a pretty cool remaster i don't know if we'd have to kind of put quotes around it but a, a bit of a remaster of the game um especially all those those cut scenes so um i think that sound like hotcakes i mean i think it would too again I but you know commentary like we've been talking about here I yeah mean, but you know think about that the thing is is that Somebody has to somebody has to go to Microsoft and bang on that door and have conversations and get the rights and get lawyers and get all that stuff. And then that person or someone else has to gather a crew so that they can take all this footage and do all the work. Then that's all going to cost a lot of money. So somebody has to create a, a fundraising campaign. It's just a huge any of this stuff is huge uh, effort uh that i don't have and and so i don't know who would be the person to spearhead this but it would it's a it's a big giant project that i would love to see someone take the reins and go with it but uh and we'd be happy to part with this footage to make it happen but i don't see anybody stepping up at this particular point well, maybe there's somebody watching this yeah maybe Knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Yeah. Well, I keep talking about Tex Murphy. They were doing, I just found out it's kind of heartbreaking. They were doing a total remaster of uh, the game after the one we're playing. I don't know the name of it. And they've been showing video clips and they had fundraising. And some of the footage that they were doing was just unbelievable. And it was all heading towards a re-release with absolute clarity of this game. Well, I just found out that um, they got shut down. I mean, they they got really far with a lot of it, but then for I don't know all the reasons, but it sounds like it it got shut down and it's not going to happen. And that's with Chris Jones, who owns his own. He's not having to fight to get the rights to anything. He owns all that stuff, and even he was unable to take it to completion for reasons I don't know. But that's a a bummer. Some kind of legal thing. I don't know. It could be internal. I, I don't know. I heard it was just a. It, it was a long, painstaking process, and you know, I'd like to talk to him. Honestly, you should you should try to talk to him. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll see if we let's 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 see what we can do. See if we can get him on one of our shows. I have to lay it on him. Yeah. Well, I know you you don't have unlimited time here, uh, Paul. So we maybe uh, I got. Do you have time for two more? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so one is you got some uh, some of your videos, or you call it Curtis and the Kid. <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so that's that's a lot of fun i had a question about this uh, what's the biggest difference in the way you and your son approach the games or approach gaming oh that's great well just yeah just a little context so curtis and the kid is, is my 14 year old son um and uh we've done a couple we did a we've only done a couple uh, and it's hard to it's hard to oh, the one his, his, the his, one. his schedule say again it was limbo is one I was watching. Limbo is the one where we were we're just about finishing. The one before that was the a short game by the folks who made the Stanley Parable. It's called Doctor Langaskoff, the Tiger and the Terribly Cursed Emerald, and it's a really fun first person sort of. It's very much in in if you've played Stanley Parable, it's very much in that in that realm. It's really fun. Um, Talk about magnificent voiceovers. Oh gosh, yeah, I'm 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 so into their they do such a great job with voiceovers. Um, so yeah, I was just thinking, uh, so my son and I, and my daughter and, and my wife, we fell in love with the game inside. That was like the very first video game I ever played. We were, we were visiting the museum of pop culture here in Seattle called Mopop. And, uh, in the top floor of one of the rooms where it was this indie game floor. So you could walk in this room and there'd be these, uh, just 
basic laptop, not laptop, but desktop computers, and they all had an indie game loaded on it. So you could just go sit at any game and just play a little bit. And my son sat down and started playing what turned out to be inside. And within like two minutes, we were all just like, oh, you got to go get what's this. And we were all so into it. So I ended up buying the game. And that one really, we all just sort of bonded over that that game and the the beauty of that world or in the creepiness of that world and um and the music and all that stuff so you know my son loves you know he's he's 14 so he grew up on roblox and minecraft and uh what? a lot of a lot of kind of also much a lot of really silly games that you play on your ipad and and things like that um so it was fun to find something that we both could connect to and he's still playing he's into a game called terraria which is a build, world building game but a lot it's just not my thing and um so for me it's really fun when we can find a game we knew limbo where it was the same made by the same people and it was the game they made prior to inside so anytime i can i can find a game that i think he would connect with too it's really fun for us to play and so we just thought or i just thought hey why not record some of these and that's an extra thing that we have on our channel now. So if somebody wants to watch an old geezer and his 14-year-old son uh, play some games and just hear his perspective on things. And awesome. he's much more he's much more dexterous in figuring out. He's much better. He already has that. He knows where the problems are and 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 he's he's quicker at solving them than I am. Um, so that's been really fun. And I, I I hope we continue to do those. I think he's, you had played some Firewatch. I don't know if it was... Uh part of that series or not. oh i love that game yeah that game was have you ever played a what remains of edith finch we did yeah we had a, a game uh we had it we'd like to bring this back but uh there's an opportunity for some of our fans and i'm not sure how it works either they 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 donate a certain amount or they it's an award that they win but uh we make them co-host for the day and so they get to choose a game oh cool that they want us to play and so then oh. we invite them on and they come in one of our what a great um, idea that is. It's really fun, yeah. And so one of our uh our you know our our watch you know, our, our our fans, I guess, uh introduced us to to that game and it's it's great. That's a that's a really cool that's a really cool game. Yeah. Now those are those are, I have to say Edith Finch, Firewatch, Stanley Parable, mm -hmm. uh, Little Nightmares and and uh the inside games, those are very much up there in terms of my favorite games right now, the kind of um, newer games that really appeal to my my sense of storytelling. You know, those games, it just so happens that I teach a game studies course here at St. Cloud State. I don't think it just so happens. I think there's a, it uh, makes, it makes well, absolute sense people, that you do that. It's a, it's a good, diverse, you know, student body and uh, but it really struck me because they, they're playing all these different games, but they all just some hardcore gamers, every, every, you know, demographic you want to talk about, they just were flabbergasted by this Edith Finch game. And they're like, this is the best game I've ever played. It changed my, Oh, know, that's so cool. That is so cool to really hear that. Got it. I was just like, Whoa, you I, know, I, I, I want to play it again because game. I mean, you like it, but I mean, wow. I, you know, I think I'm going to, I think that's one I'll bring. Maybe my son and I will play that together because that, the weird thing is, is that I had to leave the stream for, so Daniel and our guest ended up finishing it together. And so I never saw the ending. And also it was a live stream and I'm I'm engaging with them a whole bunch. So I don't, I really would like to get back to that game and explore it on my own. Cause it does. The nice thing about games like that is you really want, I don't think it's the, those are the, I started playing Firewatch with Daniel and I oh, asked I him later and I, and I said to him, I, I think this is a game is really meant to be played by yourself and so i asked his permission he said yes so i played the rest of that game on my own um because i think it's about loneliness and it's about isolation and if you're if you're streaming with somebody you don't have that same feeling so i think there are games that are really meant to be um experienced on your own and i think edith finch feels like one of them that's a really good point okay well we've got time one last question <laughs> sounds good miko uh, my question for him would be, this is a pretty good question, I think. Uh, as a person who is only just discovering the video gaming world now, as a player, that is, uh, what are two things that surprised you the most in games 
one positive and one negative. So I guess what maybe something that was a pleasant surprise versus yeah, he <laughs> was uh, shocking. I, I would yeah, that's great. I, I'm. I had no, I, you know, again, I just to go back to what turns me on as a professional, as a person is, is good stories. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just a sucker for, for, for what, you know, and, and we all have our idea of what a good story is and my and yours might differ. So I just did not know. And Firewatch is a perfect example. I did not know games these days we're exploring the kind of intricacies of of relationships or loneliness or uh you know uh solitude in a way that a game like that does i i was just i'm blown away by in general it the, the world's opened up to me you know in terms of like how games are exploring things in a way that movies never can and that is smart and intelligent and artistic and uh yeah i'm just overall i i'm just really really grateful to be able to be playing these games for the first time uh what what i what i don't like or what what i find um disturbing disturbing i mean i i think for me the hardest part is um is the moon logic and in, in games that you know i'm finding them to be more in those classic you know point and click adventure games from back when but yeah when you come up against a puzzle or a thing that just has zero sense of you know i like it when i struggle to get to someplace but then you go oh, okay i i know i struggle but now i see how one thing led to another i hate it when i get to the end or someone told me to get to the end and i see no connection between where i started and where i ended up that part is very very frustrating i should have i wish i had a list of all the games i probably should have printed something out <laughs> that you had already done videos on but i'm curious uh, the longest journey have you played that one no huh well, you might. I think you might like that one. Oh, good. Yeah, we have a. Uh, uh, if you ever want to send me a list of things that you think I, I, I'm always looking for for suggestions. We have a little little channel on our Discord of of game suggestions, and it's 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 big, but uh, we're trying to get to as many as we can. I think right this year we're trying to focus just for fun, and because Tori and I are both the one thing we have in common is that we both start in FMV games. So this year I think we're going to try to focus. Just on solely on FMV, um, but a combination of newer games like, you know, Sam Barlow's stuff or, you know, uh, uh, games like Not for Broadcast and things like that. And these older games like the Tex Murphy's and stuff. So we want to just bounce back and forth between uh, uh, newer and older uh, full motion games. Well, when you get to Mist and Riven and all that, I, I think you're going to find plenty of, I call it moon logic. <laughs> okay, man. Well, there you go. All right. Uh, but anyway, it's been such a pleasure chatting. Hey, Matt, thank you. I really appreciate you reaching out. I do. And and uh, I, I I love what you're doing. I've got a chance to look over your site and, and you've been doing this for a while. And and uh, not a lot of people are, you know, uh, creating an environment for people who love these classic games to get to know more about the people who made them. So we're really kind of on, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of do, trying to, you know, you, you've you've paved the way a little bit for us, so we appreciate uh, we appreciate that. You know, in terms of in terms of reaching out to these folks. Oh, so nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I'll go apply to WinTech now. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Be, be careful. See. I'll see. I'll see you at the water cooler. <laughs>
uh, do let me know. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, it's easy to have the ideas, but it's really the follow through that's important. So if you know how to contact somebody, uh, that would be even better. <laughs> Help him, uh, definitely would be uh, more likely to have them on the show then. Uh, but how, whatever you do, even if it's just watching uh, the show, I really appreciate it. So thank you very, very much for uh, all of your support, your likes, your views, your subs. But you know, what I really like is when you go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon page. Yes, there's a Patreon, also known as a Ratreon by cool people like you. Uh, pop over there and sign up for a membership to Mad Chat, and you get access to our awesome Discord, and you get to be part of the team, and it's just really cool. You know, I've got some old Mad Chat coins I should drag out. You know, I still got a little collection of those. Uh, let me know if you're interested in, in one of those little collectible coins, because uh, I do still have some of those I need to, uh, you know, be happy to send one to you if, if you support uh, the show. But anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, thank you once again for supporting the show. Uh, what about that news from the Mat Cave? All right, first up, we've got Punny's back with a recommendation for a game called Keeper RL. Yes, Trapper Keeper RL. <laughs> Just making up the trapper part, but hey, now that I think about it, that'd be a pretty awesome game, right? Uh, remember those covers on those things? So futuristic. Ray tracing and stuff. Okay, this is about Keeper RL. Uh, they've been around for a while, but now this is official. It's gone from uh, the early access, I guess, to <coughs> 1.0. It is on right now, Steam and GOG, 25% off. So 15 bucks will get you Keeper RL. Take the role of an evil wizard and study the methods of black magic. Yeah. Equip your minions and explore the world. Murder innocent villages and burn their homes. <coughs> Wait, <coughs> what am I reading? <laughs> uh, wow, okay, build your dungeon, lay traps. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> build your dungeon, lay traps, and prepare for an assault of angry heroes. Uh, when you control your minions, the game changes into a classic roguelike. With turn-based and very tactical combat. And this is from a uh, Polish developer uh, by the name of Electric Succubi. <laughs> and their name is Michael Brzezowski. Brzezowski? Brzezowski? Something. Brzezowski, I think. There's actually be another Z. <laughs> Lots of Zs, so you know it's got to be a good, uh, a good game. Uh, okay, moving on. Eobet uh, writes in about a game called The Darkness Below by uh, Aleph Heriadis Savas. I wonder what that name is. I didn't look up this publisher. It looks a little Greek. <laughs> I could be mistaken on that. And let's see. Embark on an epic journey into the darkness below an homage to the golden era of 90s CRPGs with grid-based movement, turn-based combat, and 2.5D perspective. <clears throat> Pretty cool. Let's see. Wonder a vast and colorful fantasy world filled with puzzles, creatures, dungeons, and guardians. Currently in early access. Now this is an ambitious game. It is set to be the largest single-player first-person grid-based CRPG of all time. So, very ambitious game. Now there was, a, Eobet did say that there's some uh, I guess a disclaimer on this, that they're using some AI-generated art. And, you know, I'm kind of curious what you uh, what you all think about that. You know, if assuming that it's not ripping, <clears throat> you know, it's not one of those AIs that actually just rips off the licensed creators. You know, if we you know, set that part aside and say that they did get permission uh, to use the artist's work as part of their training models or whatever you call it, you know, would that be okay? I'm trying to figure out if people are mad just any AI at all is bad. Uh, putting artists out of work. You know, is, is that the controversy? Is it more about the plagiarism, copyright infringement side? You know, I'm a little bit, I'm just trying to work through it all, you know, what the controversies are. Uh, but anyway, do let me know, especially if you like uh, this game, The Darkness Below. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then finally, Matt Workler wrote in about uh, some of these gaming shutdowns. This has just been happening all over the place. Uh, this time it's a gaming, uh, yeah, EA, Electronic Arts, one of the most benevolent, <laughs> known for their bene benevolence. <laughs> eh, wrong. 
Uh, anyway, they're, what are they doing? What nefarious activities are they up to now? Well, it looks like they're uh, shuttering shutter. The Seattle, is there, does, it, does shutters mean something different than shutting down? <laughs> I don't know. And it's like the old shutters, we're closing the windows, uh, of uh, Ridgeline Games. And this Ridgeline Games was uh, founded by Halo co-creator. <coughs> co Let's see what else. They worked on Battlefield. Yeah, that co-creator's name, Marcus Leto, Leto, L-E-H-T-O. Apparently he left Ridgeline and EA earlier of his own accord. Uh, and John Romero, he wasn't talking about that particular story, but I noticed he had a really, uh, you know, what's the word, <clears throat> popular? <laughs> doesn't sound like the right context, but uh, he had something on X that was getting a lot of attention where he said, let me get his uh, quote here, I've been in the game industry since I was a kid. True. And I've never seen anything like we're seeing now. For many of us, being a game dev is not just a job, but an identity, community, and culture. I am so sorry to everyone who has lost their jobs. So lots of layoffs and shutterings, I guess, going on. Uh, Polygon had an expert on by the name of Noonan, I believe. <clears throat> and they were saying, well, uh, two factors are to blame here. One is that during COVID, there was all this surge you know, of interest in games, and that's kind of petered out you know, after COVID. So that's one problem. You know, they kind of over, over hired, I guess, and now they're laying off people. Uh, but they also have another theory uh, that a lot of game developers are moving away uh, from traditional game development, making more of these games where it's your job as the player <laughs> to generate the content. And so things like Roblox comes to mind, but apparently a lot of, uh, of these big game studios are doing similar projects. Cut costs by making content production the responsibility of your users. So that's another theory. Now, I've also heard about AI might be a big factor here. You know, coming back to that earlier article about the uh, darkness below. You know, maybe these, some of these game gaming heads are like, why do we need all these artists and blah, blah, writers? You know, we can just use ChatGPT. You know, so, so is something like that going on? Uh, you know, I'd love to hear from you, especially if you're part of the you know, if you're on the inside, you know, of course, chime in, let us know uh, so we don't go around spouting nonsense. Uh, all right, what about that ale of the week? <laughs> well, uh, this time I've got one called the Best Day. Well, you will be able to see this. <laughs> Best Day Brewing Hazy IPA, uh, non-alcoholic, uh, born in uh, Northern California. Okay, let's see if we can get a lot of write-up on this one. Brewed for doers, surfers, climbers, early risers, free divers, chefs, gardeners, dancers, oyster farmers, dreamers, painters, builders, mothers, fathers, runners, nukers, no, nope, hikers. <laughs> nukers sounded kind of cool. Uh, hikers, walkers, makers, ranchers, nurses, woodworkers, teachers. Okay, I guess I maybe count with that. Skiers, bikers, doctors. I'm a doctor. Of sorts. <laughs> uh, hot air ballooners, entrepreneurs, clowns, uh, bakers, tree huggers, people huggers, uh, photographers, pit masters. That's pretty cool. I'm a pit master. Not really, but man, that's, that's what a cool job title. Neighbors, snowshoers. You know, I've never actually snowshoed, despite living in Minnesota. Uh, fishermen, done that. Fisherwomen, foragers, fans, musicians, poets, uh, life cuts. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you're covered in that list. Let's see, Best Day Brewing, Sausalito, California. And under Special Agreement, Denver, Colorado. So it's got 53 calories in it. So did they tell us what kind of hops? Water, barley, hops, and yeast. You know, I'm not going to belabor the point, but I, what harm could it be in just saying, here's the hops we used? You know, why not even tell me what kind of malts and barley you used? I mean, it's not like I'm going to try to rip this off. I just think it'd be cool to know that. Uh, so you could be a little more accurate in your taste testing. All right, let's get it open. Hopefully we don't make a mess here. I'll pour some into this clear glass first so we can see the haze. 
Oh, he's. You ever heard that Jimi Hendrix song, Purple Haze? Yeah, of course you have. <laughs> yeah, you talk to students sometimes and they're like, who's Jimi Hendrix? Who's Eric Clapton? Who's Led Zeppelin? Oh, wow, lots of action on this. It's kind of mesmerizing. It's very pretty. <laughs> A nice color. A nice head. Well, it smells really good. Very citrusy and hoppy, as you'd expect. I think I can even smell the uh, uh, the barley in this. It smells a little bit like a barley wine. You know, if you've had those, I used to love those. I guess I still do. Very strong and thick and sweet. Uh, not not for everyday drinking, but you know, for a holiday, you might want a barley wine. <laughs> okay, let's pour this in to the proper drinking receptacle. Uh, yes. Uh, drink a... Uh, okay, what is this? Best Day Brewing Hazy IPA. Let's give it a shot. Hmm. You know, this one's a kind of interesting. You know, something I've been noticing about these NAs you know, the, the first sensation you get is like, oh, this is going to be really good. <laughs> uh, and then this kind of the aftertaste is where you kind of think, oh, it's a little bit uh, watery. <laughs> you know, it just seems to be a, a, a problem a lot of these uh, non-alcoholics have. Let me try it again here. Now, this one I think is better than the one I had last time. Uh, you know, you sort of start to taste that, I guess it's probably just from years, so many years of drinking regular beer. <laughs> There's a certain aftertaste uh, that's kind of pleasant that people like, I guess, it keeps them going back for, you know, people that like beer anyway. Uh, whereas these, you sort of get that initial taste that's just identical to a beer, but then the aftertaste is always kind of like, eh, what's that? <laughs> There's nothing there. <laughs> uh, with this one, you get a little bit, I think, of the barley flavor to try to kind of Cover that a little bit more. Yeah, so this one is very close. You know, that watery you know, taste is, is minimal, you know, especially compared to the one I had last time. I'll try uh, one more swig here. Oh, heck, might as well finish it off. <laughs> yeah, so this one is pretty tasty. Um... Uh, Again, you kind of have to figure, well, non-alcoholic, it's not going to have the same uh, bite uh, as a regular beer, especially a strong, uh, <coughs> one of the stronger IPAs or a double uh, Doppelbach or something like that. But just uh, for what it is, this is a, you know, I think a pretty solid choice. You know, I could totally see just sipping on this at a party, you know, while you're gaming. <laughs> you know, you'd probably get over that. Uh, aftertaste business really quick and just start enjoying it. And I'll tell you what you'd really enjoy about this is you would be playing the same uh, quality of gaming <laughs> uh, if you have two or three of these. It doesn't tend to happen with regular beer. <laughs> yeah, so I'm really liking this. You know, the more I drink, the more I like. That's a pretty good sign. I think that's a really solid choice. Kind of lemony, citrusy, uh, a little bit bitter. You know what I think it is? You remember I was complaining last time that that beer, I, I said it, a little bit of bitterness would actually be a good thing because it would kind of compensate for that lack of alcohol. Uh, and this one's just a little bitter. You know, I, I think maybe uh, I feel kind of vindicated in that comment now because now that I've got one with some bitterness, I do think it kind of you know covers that well. End up with a much better... Uh, you end up with an N.A. that you would real quickly get over that uh, it's not a regular beer and, and just enjoy it. So I'm really pleased with this one. Uh, Hazy IPA, best uh, day brewing. You know, again, I want to segregate it from the other kinds of beers. <laughs> so just in the N.A. category alone, just compared to other non-alcoholic beers, uh, I'd probably go maybe four out of five uh, drink, drinking horns on that. You know, again, for a non-alcoholic, it's very close. It's just kind of an interesting drink uh, all around. 
Uh, now, compared, of course, to all beers, uh, then we got probably have to drop it at least one point, <laughs> like three. Uh, but even then, you know, I, I don't think you'd be disappointed with this, uh, with this selection. It's, I'm going to try it one more time. You know, I'm really uh, looking forward to trying, you know, you know, maybe even a little bit of grapefruit in that. That's a good complexity on the flavors. Uh, so definitely check this out if you get a chance. Uh, Best Day Brewing out of Northern California. I think they're on, on to something here. And I got some more uh, options from them. And so I'll try some of their different varieties too. All right, uh, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was looking for quotes by actors, famous actors, people not, you know, people known for their acting skill. And uh, you know who came up number one? <laughs> Marlon Brando. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, let's see if we got a good quote for Marlon Brando. And I think this was really good. And I'm not, I'm not going to try to do Marlon Brando's accent, uh, but I'm sure he said this in a much cooler way than I will. Uh, it goes something like this. Never confuse the size of your paycheck with the size of your talent. <laughs> and so ponder on that, and I'll see you guys next time. Just a delay. That's all it is. All major theme parks have delays. When they opened Disneyland in 1956, nothing worked. Yeah, nothing. yeah but John, if the Pirates of the Caribbean breaks down, the pirates don't eat the tourists.